Mackenzie's return to consciousness was marred by a bitter taste in her mouth, a sharp contrast to the drowsiness clouding her mind. Overwhelmed by an intense thirst and a wave of nausea, she struggled to orient herself. The persistent buzzing in her head blurred the line between her internal sensations and the external world. Initially, her surroundings were a mystery. She knew only that she lay in a cramped, confining space. Panic surged as she tried to move. The realization of being trapped in a narrow, restrictive area sent shivers down her spine. Her feet pressed futilely against an unyielding barrier. Gradually, as her mind began to shake off its cobwebs, thoughts emerged, heavy, ponderous. Desperate to call for help, Mackenzie was hindered by uncertainty. Was it the darkness around her, or was her vision betraying her? Her fear amplified, she reached out, her fingers brushing against what felt like smooth satin. Behind her, she prodded with a weak, trembling right hand, encountering an immovable wall. Reality seemed to warp. Was this a coffin? Her heart raced, her breathing grew rapid, yet screams were trapped behind her barely parted lips. In an attempt to voice her distress, only a strangled sound escaped as panic clutched her throat. Her body felt distant, unresponsive, as if paralysed by potent drugs. A cruel, sinister ploy she had unwittingly become a part of. Outside, the van carrying what appeared to be Mackenzie's coffin halted, jostling slightly on the bumpy cemetery road. The driver's door slammed with a definitive thud, followed by the scraping noise of movement. Mackenzie's heart pounded in her chest, torn between the hope of rescue and the overwhelming terror of what might come next. As her coffin was carefully unloaded and placed on the ground, Mackenzie's anxiety peaked. She yearned for release, for the sound of laughter that would signify this was all a sick joke, a twisted prank. Put her here, a familiar male voice commanded, authoritative, yet unsettlingly calm. It was Paul, Mackenzie's husband, whom she loved dearly. His involvement twisted the knot of fear and confusion tighter, leaving Mackenzie in a tumultuous blend of emotions and unanswered questions. The situation unfolded like a grotesque parody, a scenario so bizarre that Mackenzie found herself questioning its reality. Paul, her husband, known for his affinity for extreme sports and unconventional surprises, had always harboured a peculiar sense of humour. However, this instance surpassed peculiarity. It was downright malevolent. Deep within, Mackenzie clung to a sliver of hope that this was just an elaborate, albeit twisted, prank, and that she'd soon be greeted by the sound of laughter and relief. Finally, she's where she belongs, came a voice, dripping with disdain. It was Sabrina, Mackenzie's friend, or so she had believed. The pain of betrayal stung sharply. Why would Sabrina express such hostility? The realisation dawned on Mackenzie with a heavy heart. Paul and Sabrina were not just acquaintances. They were co-conspirators in a sinister plot against her. Their feigned affection was nothing but a ruse, a mask for their true intentions. I can't believe we are finally done with this, Paul's voice resonated with a chilling clarity. The faint stir of air brushed against Mackenzie's face as the gravediggers pried open the coffin lid. The fresh breeze was a small mercy, offering slight ease to her drug-laden lungs struggling for breath. I've waited for this day for so long, she won't bother us anymore. Paul's words sliced through the air. Beside him, Sabrina clasped his hand, their intimacy now unmistakably apparent. It was a union forged not in love, but in mutual greed and malice. We're lucky her father died a year ago. If not for his illness, we would have had to send him off too, Paul murmured, his voice laced with caution 
mindful of the grave diggers nearby. The revelation added another layer of horror to Mackenzie's ordeal. Their conspiracy had been long in the making. Amidst this dark tableau, a disruption, Richard's dog, an old companion of the cemetery's groundskeeper, began to whine and bark incessantly at the coffin. His instinctual unease only served to heighten the already tense atmosphere. Shut your mutt up, Sabrina screeched, her irritation breaking the somber moment. Can't you see we're having a moment? Sorry, Richard responded gruffly, admonishing his dog. Luke, be quiet. In the coffin, Mackenzie grappled with a maelstrom of emotions. Fear, betrayal, disbelief, all wrestled within her. She imagined herself screaming, revealing her consciousness, and confronting her betrayers. Yet the risk was too great. Any movement, any sign of life, could provoke Paul into a more drastic action. So she remained still, a silent witness to the cruel fate they had plotted for her. In this twisted tableau, Paul's ruthless ambition was laid bare. His proximity to a vast inheritance had eroded any semblance of morality, revealing a man capable of unspeakable acts. The thought that he could eliminate the gravediggers as easily as he had plotted against his own wife was a chilling testament to his callousness. For someone like Paul, driven by desperation and the lure of wealth, Burying more than one body in a single grave wouldn't weigh heavily on his conscience. Sabrina, leaning over Mackenzie's eerily still form, remarked with a detached air, Jesus, she doesn't even look human, more like a doll. It's creepy. Her words, devoid of empathy, echoed the coldness of the situation. Paul, confident in his sinister plan, dismissed any concerns about an autopsy. There's no close family left for Mackenzie. In this city, she only had you as a friend, he said to Sabrina. And these drugs leave the system quickly. No expert will find anything suspicious. I've taken care of everything, and I didn't do this to fail over something trivial. I've prepared. His assurance was chilling, a clear indication of how meticulously he had orchestrated this scheme. Mackenzie overhearing their conversation, felt a surge of fury but quickly suppressed it. She knew that any physical reaction, even as subtle as sweating or blushing, could betray her feigned death and seal her fate. Paul then addressed Richard and Carter, the young apprentice of the seasoned gravedigger. When will you be done? In about 20 minutes, they responded from the depths of the grave. Let's get out of here, Paul declared, wrapping his arm around Sabrina's shoulders. No need to see how it all ends. Sabrina, her tone whiny and self-absorbed, complained, I'm starving. Let's get something to eat. I'm exhausted from all this, as she adjusted her stylish leather coat. Her attire, more suited for a lavish dinner than a solemn funeral, stood out starkly against the cemetery's somber backdrop. Richard couldn't help but notice her extravagant appearance amidst the crosses and monuments. With one final glance at Mackenzie's pallid face, nestled in the soft blue satin of the coffin, Sabrina shared a smile with Paul. He paid the gravediggers and departed, leaving behind his wife's body and the persistent barking of Richard's black mongrel. In their wake, a sense of macabre finality hung in the air, a grim reminder of the depths to which greed and malice can drive the human soul. The atmosphere at the gravesite was tinged with unease, magnified by the departing couple's cold demeanour. Carter, breaking the silence, echoed the sentiment that hung heavily in the air. Strange people, he said, his voice tinged with confusion. They were so indifferent towards this woman. No flowers, no tears, no goodbyes. Richard, the seasoned gravedigger, observed Paul's car disappearing in the distance. I've seen a lot in my years here, he mused, a hint of sadness in his tone. But this is rare. She must be an orphan or something. His attention then shifted to Luke, 
the large dog who had been unusually agitated. Luke, get out of here, he scolded, but the dog's restlessness only grew. In the absence of Mackenzie's relatives, Luke's behavior became more erratic. He howled and barked incessantly at the coffin lid, as if driven by an unseen force. Exasperated and fearing the dog's strength could cause an accident, Richard tied Luke to the fence, hoping to prevent any further disturbances. You made him do this, Richard muttered to his dog, before turning to Carter. Let's lower her in. Then you can go. I'll handle the rest. Carter, ever conscientious, expressed concern about the workload. Are you sure? There's a lot of burying to do, he said. Richard, with a mixture of pride and exasperation, replied, I've buried two-thirds of the people in this cemetery, so don't tell me if I'm sure what I'm doing. Get to work. He craved solitude, a respite from Carter's constant chatter. Once Carter had left, Richard gazed down at the dark coffin lid, beginning the solemn task of burying it. But the peace was short-lived. Luke, howling with an intensity that seemed almost supernatural, broke free from his restraint and leaped into the grave. Richard, caught off guard, yelled in frustration, What's gotten into you, crazy dog? But Luke remained undeterred, his barks echoing in the grave's depths. What's bitten you today? Get back out of there, Richard demanded yet the dog's behaviour only intensified, as if urgently trying to convey a message beyond human comprehension. Richard, initially hoping Luke would climb out on his own, quickly realised the dog's agitation was more than just a random outburst. What's wrong with you? he growled, his frustration evident. Mackenzie, still inside the coffin, felt the weight of Luke landing above her. The dog's relentless barking and howling signified something urgent, something important. In a moment of clarity, Mackenzie realised she could at least attempt to make a sound. Her feeble moan, though barely audible, was enough to reinforce Luke's determination. Alarmed by the unexpected noise, Richard's heart raced. What is this now? He thought, panic setting in. He commanded Luke to step back and, with cautious movements, he squeezed into the grave. Carefully avoiding the coffin, he lifted the lid and was struck with disbelief. There, before him, were the grey eyes of a woman thought to be dead. Mother of God, Richard exclaimed, recoiling in shock as Mackenzie tried to utter something, her words tangled and indistinct. How on earth are you alive? Oh dear, Richard blurted out, his voice a mix of concern and astonishment. He assisted Mackenzie into a sitting position, his eyes locked with hers, which were brimming with fear. Are they still here? She whispered weakly, her voice trembling as tears rolled down her cheeks. Who? Oh, those... the scoundrels! Richard nearly cursed, his anger palpable. We need to call the doctors. How do you feel? We need an ambulance right away, he said, his mind racing with what to do next. Mackenzie, gathering the little strength she had, extended her hand, signalling him to stop. Don't, please, she implored. We can't scare them away if they find out. I'm all right, just need some time, I guess, she added, her voice barely above a whisper. All right. As you say, let's get you out of here, Richard agreed, his tone now calmer but still laced with concern. As Mackenzie emerged from the coffin, the weight of her near demise hit her. She wept, clinging to the earth, her hands grappling for support as she struggled to the surface. Surrounded by crosses and portraits of the deceased, the grim reality of her situation sank in deeper she realised, with a heavy heart, that she could have been one of them, lost and forgotten, if not for the miraculous intervention that saved her life. Her relief was profound, 
yet tinged with the haunting knowledge of how close she had come to an undeserved end. Mackenzie, overwhelmed by the harrowing experience, pleaded with Richard, her voice trembling with desperation. Take me away from here, please, she implored, squatting and covering her face with her hands, as if to shield herself from the grim reality that surrounded her. Richard, understanding the urgency of her request, paused only briefly to consider the situation. Mackenzie was clearly in a state of shock, and it wouldn't be right to ask her to wait while he dealt with the logistics of the disturbed grave and the relocation of the coffin. He resolved to handle everything early the next morning, before anyone could notice the disturbance. Soon, Mackenzie found herself in the same van that had transported her to the cemetery, but now, as a living, breathing passenger. The reality of her ordeal weighed heavily on her mind. Just a day ago, she had been having dinner with her husband, Paul, in their luxurious two-story house, a legacy from her parents. Now, she grappled with the chilling realization that she had narrowly escaped death at his hands. She speculated that Paul must have drugged her wine during their anniversary dinner, causing her to lose consciousness without any suspicion. She recalled their conversation from the previous night. It doesn't seem like you, she had said playfully, locking eyes with Paul. Usually, it's the best restaurant, live music and all. Paul had leaned in, kissed her and replied, Don't start this now. It was hard to give it up. I did it for you, by the way. Mackenzie had giggled, unaware of the impending betrayal. Yeah, I really appreciate your desire to please me, she had responded. Being alone on such an important day for us is the best option. You even let the chefs go early today and cooked everything yourself. Now, those memories were tainted with the bitter taste of deceit. She pondered over Paul's words from the night before each one now seeming like a carefully crafted lie. How long had he been plotting this? The realization that her close friend Sabrina was also involved added a deeper layer of betrayal to her pain. How could she have stabbed her in the back like that? The questions swirled in her mind, each one a painful reminder of the treachery she had narrowly survived. Sabrina, who hailed from a middle-class background, had always harboured aspirations that stretched far beyond her modest upbringing. When she arrived at university, her strategy was clear and deliberate. She sought out friendships exclusively with those who came from wealth and influence. It was in this calculated social manoeuvring that her path crossed with Mackenzie's. Mackenzie, coming from a well-to-do family, was a prime target for Sabrina's agenda. Initially, their friendship seemed genuine. They shared classes, laughed at the same jokes, and spent countless hours discussing their dreams and ambitions. However, beneath Sabrina's friendly exterior lay a more opportunistic motive. Remember how we met, Mackenzie? Sabrina would often reminisce with a smile. We were paired for that economics project, and I knew right then we'd be great friends. Mackenzie would laugh, replying, Yes, and I thought you were the serious, studious type. Little did I know you were more interested in my family's summer house than my lecture notes. Their banter, once light and filled with the innocence of college days, now echoed hauntingly in Mackenzie's mind as she pieced together the reality of their relationship. Sabrina's interest had always been more in what Mackenzie could offer her socially and materially rather than a genuine connection. This realization, coming in the wake of her near-death experience, painted their past interactions in a starkly different light, revealing the depth of Sabrina's deceit and the fragility of their so-called friendship. Mackenzie, still reeling from the shock of her ordeal, made her way into the watchman's hut. Her legs were shaky, a physical testament to the trauma she had just endured. The modest interior of the hut barely registered in her mind as she hurried to find a place to sit, 
her thoughts consumed by the betrayal she had narrowly escaped. Richard, ever the compassionate soul, moved to put the kettle on. You'll feel better soon, he assured her, his voice a calming presence in the turmoil of the moment. I'll brew you some tea. I'd offer something stronger, but staying sober right now is best. Besides, we shouldn't mix it with the drugs, if that's what they used. Mackenzie pressed her temples, her voice laced with distress. My mind is foggy. My husband drugged me with some sort of dose. My brain feels melted, she confessed. You're the only one who knows about my situation, and I don't want anyone else to know. You're the only one who can help me. I'm sorry to ask, but I need to borrow some money. I will definitely return it. They were after my fortunes, and that's why they wanted... To kill me, she finally admitted, her voice steady despite the gravity of her words. Richard looked at her, his expression a mix of astonishment and sympathy. In his many years at the cemetery, he had witnessed a myriad of human emotions and experiences, but nothing like this. The thought of someone, especially a spouse, resorting to such a heinous act was beyond his comprehension. Your husband certainly seemed like a scoundrel, he said, shaking his head in disbelief as he observed Mackenzie's distraught state. She was visibly shaken, the stress and anger of her experiences manifesting in her trembling form. I'll give you the money. Don't worry, my dear. How could I leave you in such a situation? Richard said, his tone firm and reassuring. But what are you going to do? He inquired, concern etched in his voice. Mackenzie, her resolve hardening, replied, I don't know yet. But one thing's for sure. That monster will pay for everything. I'll make sure they both get what they deserve. They wanted to kill me, and in such a barbaric way. How naive I was, she lamented, her tears a poignant reflection of the innocence she had lost and the determination she had gained. As Mackenzie sat in the watchman's hut, processing the turmoil of her recent ordeal, Luke the loyal dog who had played a crucial role in her rescue, stirred from his spot on the floor. He approached her and laid his heavy head on her lap, seeking affection in his own canine way. What a good boy, Mackenzie said softly, her fingers gently stroking him between the ears. She smiled down at him, gratitude shining in her eyes. I didn't even thank you, silly me. After all, it was you who saved me, she acknowledged, addressing her furry rescuer. Luke's tail wagged in response, his demeanor reflecting the happiness and satisfaction of being praised. Luke is smart, Richard chimed in, a proud smile on his face, as he too reached out to stroke the dog's black back. I've gotten used to him over the seven years he's been with me. You wouldn't believe how tiny he was when I first found him in the streets, he reminisced about the day he found Luke. Mackenzie's gaze shifted from Luke to Richard. I'll stay at a hotel tonight. It's a bit cramped for guests here, she said, acknowledging the modesty of the hut. All right, Richard responded, standing up and walking over to his desk. He opened a drawer and pulled out his wallet. Here, he said handing Mackenzie a few bills. This should be enough for the time being. I'll call you a cab. That night, Mackenzie found herself in a rundown hotel, struggling to find sleep. The events of the previous day haunted her, instilling a deep-seated fear of closing her eyes. Her mind raced with unsettling thoughts. What if Paul discovered her escape and came after her, could he and Sabrina be watching her even now? But above all, Mackenzie grappled with the daunting task of exposing her husband and her treacherous friend. She knew she needed to act wisely and strategically. After a restless night, with dawn breaking, Mackenzie finally managed to close her eyes, her resolve crystallizing. She knew what she had to do. 
Returning to the cemetery the next day, she made her way straight to Richard's hut, only to find it empty. Walking among the graves, a chill ran down her spine as she thought about the horrifying reality that she could have been one of the silent residents of this solemn place. The thought that her life could have ended at just 29 years old was a frightening contemplation, reinforcing her determination to confront the injustice that had been done to her. Mackenzie's call for Richard was met with Luke's enthusiastic response, his joy at seeing her again evident in his playful jumps and wagging tail. Hey, my good boy, she greeted, petting his shiny fur affectionately. She then followed Luke to where Richard was diligently working, clearing weeds that had encroached upon an old grave. You're back again. I hope you haven't changed your mind about staying here, Richard said with a light-hearted chuckle, not pausing in his task. Mackenzie responded with a smile. Yep, I'm back, and I need your help again. Joining Richard, Mackenzie began to awkwardly pull at the thick grass. Her inexperience was evident, but the physical activity provided a calming effect. Richard, noticing her struggle, handed her a small hoe. Take this instead. Just don't hit your feet. So, what's the plan? He inquired. Mackenzie outlined her strategy. We need to scare Paul. Call him and say you know his secret, that you saw me open my eyes and that I'm alive. If he denies it, we'll say your partner knows too. Then Paul will have no choice but to try to silence you. Demand a large sum for your silence. When you meet, get them talking so every word is recorded. Paul's a braggart. I'm sure he'll talk. Sounds like a plan, Richard agreed, impressed with her thought process. We could give it a try, but let me finish here first. After about half an hour, they were ready to make the call. Richard, with a deep breath, dialed Paul's number and waited for him to pick up. Hello, it's Richard. We need to meet and talk about how you buried your wife alive. I will see you at my hut today at 4pm. I'll also text you the amount of money you will need to bring to keep me quiet. He hung up after Paul's brief, startled response. So, what did he say? Mackenzie asked, her anxiety palpable. Well, he only said, okay. He must have been so scared that he didn't even bargain, Richard replied. Before implementing their plan, they had informed a police officer. The officer soon arrived, questioning Mackenzie thoroughly about her experience and the plan they intended to execute. As the clock ticked towards the appointed time, tension hung in the air, their carefully laid trap waiting to spring. Mackenzie's ordeal had reached a critical juncture, and as she narrated the harrowing details to Officer Andrews, his astonishment was evident. So you're saying your husband planned your death? He asked, his tone reflecting both surprise and disbelief. Well, he's quite inventive. You'll see for yourself soon, Mackenzie replied, her voice steady with a resolve forged in the fires of betrayal. Together with Officer Andrews, she concealed herself around the hut, waiting for Paul's arrival, ensuring they remained out of sight. Paul, cautious and vigilant, scanned the area as he arrived, confirming he was unobserved. He greeted Richard with a handshake before entering the hut. Not bad, old man, Paul remarked with a hint of condescension as he closed the door. Did it take you all day to decide on blackmailing me? Richard, struggling to contain his anger, replied coolly, Well, it's the opportunity of a lifetime, I guess. Paul, with his characteristic arrogance, handed a bag to Richard. Keep quiet about this, he warned. If anything leaks out, you'll be my first suspect, and then a new grave will be yours. His threat was as chilling as it was direct. Richard, barely holding back his emotions, asked, Why did you do that to her? It must have been a terrible death. She was moving in that coffin, she must have woken up underground. 
Paul, devoid of any remorse, casually admitted his miscalculation. I hoped she would die in her sleep. Seems the drugs wore off earlier. But it doesn't matter now. The deed is done. You're my accomplice. So if you try to turn me in, you'll be punished too. His confession was cold and calculated. Mackenzie was a bold, spoiled brat. She never treated me as an equal, so she got what she deserved, Paul declared dismissively, turning to leave. But as he opened the door, he froze. There stood Officer Andrews and, to his shock, Mackenzie, very much alive. Now you can't run, Mackenzie said, her voice tinged with a mix of triumph and anger as she struck her husband across the face. But Paul, maintaining his composure, pushed past them and sprinted towards his car. Luke, get him, Richard commanded. The loyal black dog pounced on Paul, knocking him down and latching onto his leg, tearing at his pants. Get this stupid mutt off, Paul yelled desperately, trying to shake Luke off. Turning to Richard, Mackenzie asked, Do we have the recording of Sabrina? Richard smiled confidently, pulling out his phone. You doubt me. I've got everything. These scoundrels won't get away. His words were a reassurance of justice, a promise that the truth would not remain buried. With the arrest of Paul and Sabrina, Mackenzie finally found herself in a place of safety and relief. The weight of the harrowing ordeal began to lift, allowing her to focus on providing her statement and preparing for the upcoming trial. She made it a point to avoid any unnecessary encounters with Paul and Sabrina, unwilling to be subjected to their deceit or false displays of remorse. While Paul remained unapologetically greedy and cruel, Sabrina resorted to insincere pleas for forgiveness. Mackenzie, please forgive me. He talked me into it. It was all him, Sabrina implored, grasping at Mackenzie's sleeve during an unexpected encounter at the prosecutor's office. Please forgive me. He threatened to kill me too. I would never do anything like that to you, Sabrina continued, her tears flowing freely. However, Mackenzie remained stoic, her face betraying no emotion in response to Sabrina's desperate pleas. Keep her away from me, Mackenzie requested of the officer nearby. I don't want to see her. Returning to her parents' home provided a sanctuary for Mackenzie. The first thing she did was surrender to a deep, restorative sleep. She had feared that sleep might elude her after such a traumatic experience, but the knowledge that Paul and Sabrina were no longer a threat allowed her to drift off with ease. In the quiet moments of reflection, Mackenzie acknowledged the crucial role played by Richard and his loyal dog, Luke, in saving her life and ensuring justice. They had been her unexpected guardians, stepping into her life at its darkest hour and guiding her back to safety. Their bravery and quick thinking had not only saved her from a tragic fate, but it also helped bring those who wished her harm to face the consequences of their actions. Once the turmoil surrounding her ordeal had settled, Mackenzie felt a strong urge to express her gratitude to those who had been instrumental in her survival. She decided to visit Richard, the gravedigger who had played a pivotal role in her rescue. Along with her, she brought gifts to show her appreciation a new jacket for Richard, and a collar, along with some treats for his loyal dog, Luke. As Mackenzie approached the cemetery, her heart was filled with a mixture of emotions. The place that had almost been her final resting spot now held a different meaning for her. She spotted Richard, who was tending to his usual duties, and approached him with a warm smile. Richard? She called out gently not wanting to startle him. Richard turned around, surprised to see her. Mackenzie, what brings you back here? He asked, his face breaking into a welcoming grin. I just wanted to say thank you, properly this time, Mackenzie replied, holding out the jacket towards him. 
I hope this keeps you warm during those cold nights. Richard accepted the jacket, his eyes reflecting his gratitude. Thank you, Mackenzie. This means a lot, he said, feeling the fabric between his fingers. And this, Mackenzie continued, revealing the collar and treats, is for Luke. At the mention of his name, Luke trotted over, his tail wagging in excitement. Mackenzie knelt down to fasten the new collar around his neck and offered him a treat, which he accepted eagerly. He's been a true hero, she said, scratching Luke behind the ears. He sure is, Richard agreed, watching the interaction with a smile. He's got a knack for sensing when something's wrong. In the midst of their conversation, Mackenzie felt a surge of warmth and gratitude towards Richard. Recognising how significantly he had impacted her life, she wanted to extend her appreciation beyond just gifts. Richard, I was wondering, she began, her voice tinged with sincerity. If I could invite you for dinner, it's the least I can do to thank you properly for everything. Richard, taken aback by the invitation, hesitated for a moment, his usual reticence evident. Oh, I don't know, Mackenzie. I'm not much of a dinner guest, he replied modestly. Mackenzie smiled, understanding his reluctance. Please, it would mean a lot to me. You've done so much, and I just want to show my appreciation in a small way. It doesn't have to be anything formal. After a brief pause, a gentle smile broke through Richard's reserved exterior. Well, in that case... How could I refuse such a kind offer? I'd be honoured to join you for dinner, Mackenzie. As they dined in the warm, inviting atmosphere of the restaurant, Mackenzie couldn't help but wonder about the stark contrast between Richard's gentle demeanour and his sombre occupation. Leaning forward, she asked softly, How did you come to work in such an unusual place? It seems so different from who you are. Richard paused, his eyes reflecting a distant memory. Well, Mackenzie, my life 35 years ago was a world apart from what it is now. He began, his voice tinged with a hint of nostalgia. I was married to Natalie, a wonderful woman with the kindest heart. We had a little boy, Johnny. He was just two years old at the time. Mackenzie listened intently, sensing the shift in Richard's tone. Natalie was studying to be a teacher and I worked in construction. We were just a regular young family, full of dreams and aspirations, Richard continued. He paused, gathering his thoughts before delving deeper into his past. One day, we were coming back from a trip to the mountains, celebrating Natalie's graduation. She had just finished her degree and was on the verge of starting her career. Richard's eyes clouded with sadness as he recounted the tragic turn of events. It was raining heavily and the roads were slippery. I was driving and I lost control of the truck. It crashed into a tree on the passenger side, right where Natalie was sitting. Mackenzie's heart ached as she listened, understanding the depth of the tragedy that had befallen him. Natalie. She didn't survive the crash. Johnny was safe, strapped in his seat between us. But my world shattered that day. Richard's voice broke slightly, the pain still raw, even after so many years. The worst part was the aftermath. They found traces of alcohol in my system. Natalie's aunt, who never approved of me, convinced everyone that I was to blame for the accident. The guilt, the grief... It was overwhelming, he confessed, his eyes downcast. Mackenzie reached across the table, placing her hand over Richard's in a gesture of comfort. I'm so sorry, Richard. That's an unimaginable loss, she said softly. Richard looked up, meeting her eyes. Thank you, Mackenzie. Life took a strange turn after that. I lost much more than my wife that day. It led me down a path I never expected, 
one that eventually brought me to the cemetery. It's a place of solace in a way, a place where I can reflect and remember. On that fateful day, Richard had consumed a few beers, and while he was certain the wet road had been the primary cause of the accident, he never contested the accusations levelled against him. The guilt he felt was overwhelming, regardless of the actual circumstances. He accepted the blame, succumbing to the weight of the tragedy and the judgments of those around him. Natalie's aunt, Carla, took custody of Johnny, Richard's young son. This development added another layer of heartache to Richard's already burdened soul. Subsequently, Richard faced the harsh reality of the legal system. He was sentenced to eight years in prison for reckless driving that led to the death of his wife. In the face of such a devastating verdict, Richard stood alone, devoid of any support or advocacy. He accepted his sentence quietly, a man resigned to his fate. Upon his release, Richard returned to a community that viewed him through a lens of condemnation and mistrust. The warm, welcoming neighbourhood he once knew was gone, replaced by cold stares and whispered judgments. His son, Johnny, who had been raised by Carla, remained an unreachable part of Richard's past. Richard yearned for contact, aching for the opportunity to embrace his son, to explain, to reconnect. But Johnny had grown up under the shadow of a narrative that painted Richard as a killer, an image too ingrained for a young mind to question. Years later, when Richard attempted to reach out to his now-grown son, he received a letter in response, not from Johnny, but from Carla. John is a grown man, and you are his mother's killer for him, the letter stated bluntly. These words were a crushing blow to Richard, extinguishing any lingering hope of reconciliation. This rejection plunged Richard deeper into despair. He withdrew from the world, consumed by his sorrows and regrets. There were moments when the isolation of his small house became too much, and he longed for the numbness of his prison days. As Richard gazed out of his window on a rainy day, his eyes were drawn to an old tree in front of his house. He had planted it when Johnny was born, envisioning a future where his son would play and climb its branches. But that future had never materialised. On this particular rainy day, Richard's attention was caught by a small black puppy sheltering under the tree, shivering in the cold. He watched from behind the window, waiting to see if anyone would come for it. As the rain grew heavier, droplets slipped through the leaves, drenching the poor creature. After 30 minutes, with no one in sight to claim the puppy, Richard, for the first time in a week, felt a compelling urge to step outside. He rushed out into the rain and scooped up the shivering puppy, bringing it into the warmth of his home. He shared his food, and the puppy, comforted and content, soon fell asleep in his lap. As he gently petted the little dog, Richard felt a profound shift within him. That day marked the end of his lonely existence. He named the puppy Luke. As Luke grew, he became more active, often barking and signalling his desire to go outside. Richard, still reclusive and longing only for his wife Natalie, would take Luke on early morning visits to her grave, ensuring they remained unseen by others. It was during one of these visits that Richard stumbled upon an advertisement for a cemetery guard and gravedigger position. The job seemed tailor-made for him. It promised physical activity, minimal interaction with people, and, most importantly, it would keep him close to Natalie. Mackenzie, deeply moved by Richard's story, rose from her seat and sat next to him. She didn't speak. Words seemed inadequate in the face of such profound sorrow and resilience. Instead, she simply sat beside him, 
holding his hand in a gesture of solidarity and understanding. After enjoying a delightful dinner, Mackenzie drove Richard back to his place. Once Richard had safely entered his home, Mackenzie turned her car towards her own abode, her mind buzzing with thoughts. Besides managing her thriving business, she now found herself with an additional intriguing mission. This new task, which had unexpectedly emerged during their conversation over dinner, sparked a mix of excitement and determination in her. Two months later, Mackenzie drove into a quaint southern town where she hoped to find John Clark, the son of Richard. On reaching what she believed was his last known address, she found the house unresponsive to her knocks. Deciding to wait until the evening for the resident's return, she drove to a local diner to pass the time and grab a bite. As she drove past a nearby high school, Mackenzie's attention was captured by a group of teenagers engaged in a fundraising activity. Curious and feeling generous, she stopped to contribute. As she approached, two exuberant teenage girls holding collection boxes eagerly approached her car. We're helping out our teacher, Mr. Clark, one of them called out enthusiastically, while the other chuckled. Mackenzie, intrigued but cautious, initially drove away, only to park in a nearby lot shortly after. She returned to the girls, slipping some bills into their boxes before inquiring about the cause of their fundraiser. Oh, Mr. Clark's our math teacher. He's really nice, and we want to help him out, the girls said, each trying to outdo the other in their description. The other girl, with a mix of exasperation and humour, chided her friend. Matea, she's asking what the fundraiser is for, she laughed, then turned back to Mackenzie. Sorry about that, she's just excited to skip math class today. We're raising money for Mr. Clark's mum. She's in the hospital fighting cancer. We all love Mr. Clark, so we want to help. Mackenzie felt a wave of confusion. She was searching for John Clark, who, to her knowledge, had lost his mother in a tragic car accident years ago. The situation didn't add up. Gathering her thoughts, Mackenzie addressed the girls. Can you take me to your teacher? I'd like to meet Mr. Clark. Mackenzie found herself in the school hallway, anxiously awaiting the end of John Clark's class. The bell finally rang, signaling the flood of teenagers streaming out of the classroom. With a deep breath, she prepared herself to meet the son Richard had lost so many years ago. She introduced herself to John, who emerged from the classroom. Mackenzie chose her words carefully, aware of the delicate nature of the conversation. She avoided shocking him with the full extent of her connection to his father, instead opting for a more general introduction. Gradually, she began to weave the story of Richard, watching as John's expression shifted from curiosity to sadness, then to anger. John, clearly unsettled, asked why Mackenzie had sought him out and what she wanted from him. When he inquired about the significance of this meeting to her, Mackenzie realised she couldn't avoid mentioning her own harrowing experience. John listened, visibly shocked as Mackenzie recounted her near-death experience and miraculous survival. As she explained her mission, John's expression turned to one of hesitance. He explained his current situation, caring for his sick Aunt Clara and struggling to cover her medical expenses. Seizing the opportunity, Mackenzie proposed a deal. She offered to take care of all Clara's medical bills in exchange for one thing, that John agree to meet with his father, Richard, and listen to his side of the story. Her offer was motivated not just by a desire to help Richard reconnect with his son, but also by a sense of gratitude for the life she now owed to Richard's intervention. On a warm spring day, during the school break, John found himself driving for hours to a town he couldn't recall, having left it as a baby. He was meeting Mackenzie, and together they were heading to the cemetery where Richard worked. 
Arriving at the cemetery, they saw Richard diligently tending to overgrown areas, his dedication to his job evident. Nearby, Luke, his loyal dog, was enjoying the sunshine. As John and Mackenzie approached, John glanced at her, uncertainty flickering in his eyes. Mackenzie gave him a reassuring nod, signalling it was time. Richard, noticing their approach, looked up, his face lit up with a broad smile upon seeing Mackenzie. Well, it's you again. What's the surprise this time? He asked with a chuckle, happy to see her. After warmly embracing Mackenzie, Richard's eyes fell on John. He gave him a thoughtful once-over, then turned back to Mackenzie with a playful grin. Good choice, he joked. New boyfriend? Mackenzie, caught off guard by the comment, glanced at John and blushed slightly. Not really. At least not yet, she replied, her words light but carrying an unspoken gravity. John's eyebrow quirked at her response, a hint of surprise in his expression. Mackenzie's smile then slowly faded, replaced by a look of profound serenity. She stepped forward, gently taking Richard's hand. Her smile returned, warmer now, as she met his gaze. It's always good to see you, Richard. She then turned her smile towards John. This man is a wonderful math teacher. His name is John Clark, and he is your son, Richard. Richard's face registered a mix of disbelief and profound shock. His gaze shifted to John, who was already on the brink of tears, standing just a few feet away. Richard remained motionless, as if time had stopped, his eyes locked onto John's. He was afraid to blink, fearing that the moment he did, the floodgates of his own emotions would open. He began nervously scratching his rough palm, a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions racing through his mind. For years, he had been haunted by the question of what had become of his son, where he might be. Now, suddenly, the answer was right in front of him. John, too, was grappling with his own tumultuous feelings. He had grown up despising the man he now faced, fueled by years of resentment and misunderstanding. But now, confronted with the truth and the sight of his father on the verge of tears, his long-held perceptions were crumbling. Mackenzie, observing the charged silence between father and son, felt the need to intervene. Will you go ahead and give each other a hug already? She encouraged gently. Her words broke the spell. John, laughing through his tears, felt a release from the tension that had been building inside him. He moved towards his father and embraced him fully, the years of separation and misunderstanding melting away in their shared embrace. In that embrace, years of pain, regret and lost time seemed to dissolve. For Richard, it was a moment of redemption and reunion. For John, a moment of discovery and reconciliation. The reunion between Richard and John was a moment filled with raw, unfiltered emotion. Richard, who had maintained a facade of composure, found himself overwhelmed by the warmth of his son's embrace. Tears streamed down his cheeks as he felt John's strong arms around him, a connection he had yearned for over countless lonely years. Gently, he touched John's back, marvelling at how the small boy he remembered had grown into a strong, capable man. I've waited for this day all my life, son, Richard managed to say, his voice choked with emotion. John, equally moved, expressed his regret. I'm so sorry, Dad, he said, his voice laden with guilt for having accepted the misconceptions about his father without seeking the truth himself. Richard understood the complexity of John's feelings. He knew that John had been too young to comprehend the full story and had formed his opinions based on what others had told him. Meanwhile, Luke, Richard's loyal dog, had made himself comfortable in Mackenzie's lap. She embraced him, kissing his head tenderly. Luke seemed to sense the significance of the moment 
gazing up at Mackenzie with understanding eyes. The rest of the afternoon was spent in the cemetery. John and Richard visited Natalie's grave together, a moment of shared reflection and remembrance. Afterwards, John assisted Richard with his duties, pulling weeds and catching up on lost time. Mackenzie, recognising the importance of the father and son having time alone, took Luke for a walk. As the day drew to a close, Mackenzie extended an invitation for dinner at her house, wanting to celebrate the newfound connection between father and son. Luke, who had grown fond of Mackenzie, seemed reluctant to part with her. Smiling, she asked if she could take him along in her car, to which Richard readily agreed. He was somewhat relieved, as Luke's playful energy, heightened by the day's events, had him mischievously running off with Richard's tools. Mackenzie, having inherited her father's business and the large house that came with it, chose to live a life of simplicity in stark contrast to the wealth she had grown up with. Her father had employed staff to maintain the house, but Mackenzie preferred to handle things herself whenever she could. That evening, she had personally prepared the dinner table creating a warm and inviting atmosphere without the assistance of Gloria, the housekeeper. She had encouraged Gloria to take an early leave and enjoy a few days off. The reason for having a housekeeper at all was practical. The house was simply too big for one person to manage. It was a testament to her father's dreams and aspirations, a grand structure that he had always envisioned. The dinner was a delightful experience, filled with lively conversation, shared laughter, and the joy of newfound connections. Richard, in a moment of heartfelt gratitude, thanked Mackenzie for the role she played in reuniting him with his son and giving him the opportunity to clear the air. As the evening gently merged into night, John prepared to leave, his car keys in hand. Mackenzie, Richard and John lingered outside, savouring the final moments of their gathering. Tonight meant more to me than I can say, Richard spoke, his voice laden with emotion. Mackenzie, without your kindness, this, he gestured towards John, this reunion might never have happened. John nodded in agreement. I can't thank you enough. Today has changed everything for me. Mackenzie smiled warmly. I'm just glad I could help bring you two together. It's been a beautiful evening. As John got into his car, he paused, looking back at Mackenzie and Richard. I'll be back to visit soon. This isn't goodbye, just a see you later, he said with a hopeful smile. Drive safe, son, Richard called out, a proud smile on his face. As John drove home, his mind was a whirlwind of emotions. The revelations about his father, Richard, had turned his world upside down, and now he faced the daunting task of confronting his aunt Carla. Carla, who had been like a mother to him, had also been the source of the falsehoods that kept him estranged from his father for years. John grappled with feelings of betrayal yet he couldn't ignore the care and love she had provided him all these years. Carla's medical bills had been generously covered by Mackenzie, a gesture that had facilitated Carla's recovery and her return home. This act of kindness added another layer of complexity to John's feelings. When he arrived home, Carla was waiting for him. Her eyes, filled with a silent remorse, met his as he walked in. She looked at him with a plea for forgiveness in her gaze. Please forgive me, she uttered softly, her voice laden with regret. John's thoughts went back to what Richard had said to him earlier. No matter what she said, it's in the past now. She took you in and gave you things I wasn't able to give. Forgive her, son. With those words echoing in his mind, John didn't respond verbally. Instead, he took a moment, then walked slowly towards Carla. He embraced her, signalling his forgiveness without the need for words. It was a hug that conveyed understanding, acceptance 
and a willingness to move beyond the past. As time passed, John found himself drawn increasingly towards his father, Richard, and their newfound relationship. His visits became more frequent, a routine that he cherished. Each time he went to see Richard, he made it a point to stop by Mackenzie's as well. Their bond, which had formed under such extraordinary circumstances, continued to grow stronger. During one of these visits, Richard couldn't help but notice the extra spring in John's step whenever he mentioned Mackenzie. Teasingly, he commented, You seem more excited to see Mackenzie than your old man. John blushed at the remark, but he couldn't deny the truth in his father's words. His relationship with Mackenzie had blossomed into something more than friendship. Soon enough, they started dating, their connection deepening with each passing day. For Richard, watching his son find happiness was a source of great joy. It was as if his life, which had once been shrouded in darkness and despair, was finally aligning onto a path of light and hope. He often found himself reflecting on the serendipity that had led him to his job at the cemetery. This job, which had seemed like a retreat from the world, had unexpectedly brought him closer to God, allowed him to reunite with his son and witness the blossoming of a new love. Thank God for leading me to that job, Richard would often say quietly to himself. It's brought more blessings than I could have ever imagined. As Richard watched his son and Mackenzie, he felt a profound sense of gratitude. The cemetery, a place of endings, had paradoxically become a place of new beginnings for him and his family. It was a reminder that life, in all its complexity, always held the potential for redemption and joy. Richard stood in front of Natalie's grave, a fresh bouquet of flowers in his hand, a gentle smile on his face. The vibrant colours of the flowers contrasted beautifully with the solemnity of the gravestone, symbolising the new lease of life that Richard had found. Looking at Natalie's grave, he spoke softly, as if she could hear him. I've found happiness again, Natalie. I wish you could see how things have turned around. With a final glance at the grave, Richard turned and walked away, his steps lighter than they had been in years. He carried with him the warmth of renewed relationships and the promise of many more joyful days to come. The sun shone down on him, casting a gentle glow that mirrored the lightness in his soul, a soul that had, against all odds, found its way back to happiness.